Welcome back to Authors and Innovators. I'm Larry Gennari. Thank you for spending some of your time with us. If you enjoy these books, please visit the link below and support our independent bookseller, Nantucket Book Partners. Thanks, too, to our sponsors. Needham & Company is our presenting sponsor. They're a globally recognized investment banking and asset management firm focused solely on growth companies and their investors. Founded in 1985, the firm is headquartered in New York with offices in Boston, Chicago, Minneapolis, San Francisco, and in Menlo Park. I also want to thank Launchpad Venture Group, a network of active angel investors building individual portfolios by investing both financial and human capital in New England area startups. The Boston Business Journal, our current and continuing sponsor, and of course, our host, Babson College and the Arthur M. Blank School for Entrepreneurial Leadership. Hey, this is Christopher Mirabile here with uh, a tip. Uh, I run Launchpad Venture Group, and uh, I'm here to say some supportive words about this Authors and Innovators program. It's a fantastic program. Um, we've participated uh, in it before and uh, are, are proud uh, to be alongside Babson as a sponsor this year. Uh, what I like best about this program is that I discover books I hadn't yet heard about, and better yet, I get to get the author's take on it. Uh, I found it uh, fascinating to go through that process when we were uh, participating a couple of years ago with our uh, Entrepreneur's Journey book, which we released um, about 24 months ago now. And uh, having to sort of boil the whole book down uh, into, a, into a short uh, conversation made it, I think, really accessible for the readers, and it led to a lot of really interesting engagement. Uh, so as someone who participates in the Boston innovation ecosystem, uh, Launchpad Venture Group is a, a large 175 uh, investor group that backs early stage startups from Babson and other places. I find this kind of program to be absolutely essential for making those connections, finding those ideas, uh, and, and getting out there and mixing it up. So check it out at uh, authorsinnovators.org. It's a terrific program. You can go for the entire uh, entire program, or you can uh, pick uh, different different sessions that you want to see. Can't say enough good things. Uh, about this about this program and i'm proud to be a sponsor and to be affiliated best of luck thank you today we'll talk about returning returning to our shared values innovation and our shared community and we'll kick things off with we the possibility by professor mitch weiss Welcome to this conversation with uh, Mitchell Weiss, author of We the Possibility, Harnessing Public Entrepreneurship to Solve Our Most Urgent Problems. Uh, Mitch, thanks for joining me. You're a professor of management practice at the Harvard Business School, where you've been since 2014. And before that, you were chief of staff to uh, Boston Mayor Tom Menino and where you, in Boston, where you co-created the Mayor's Office of New Urban Mechanics. I'd love for you to share a little bit more about how that office came about. It sounds fascinating, but first I want to introduce your book, We the Possibility. So it's a great book. I really enjoyed it. I got a lot out of it. And so looking forward to speaking with you about it. So right out of the gate of your book, you write about possibility government versus probability government. I was wondering if you could share with our audience, just describe the difference between what that what those terms mean and how that connects with what you were trying to do when you were in the Menino administration with that Office of New Urban Mechanics. Sure, Doug, and, and thanks for having me. Um, and thanks uh, for the opportunity to sort of describe the two phenomena. I think it's so essential to understanding how we move forward in this country right now to see that oftentimes, and for the most part, we tend towards probability government, where we do things that will probably work. They've been tried before, they've been done before, but if we're being honest about it, actually, they're, they sort of lead to middling or mediocre outcomes. Mm. I, I call the, that, that sort of notion, the thing we've done, the thing we've seen, the thing we're doing as probability government. And my deep belief is that if we're really going to solve the problems that face us, we've got to move on in more instances from probability government to possibility government. And possibility is doing the new and novel things. Okay, So the new and novel things, 
that by virtue of their newness are um, only possibly going to work, which means they probably won't work, which I realize is quite a fraught thing to say these days. But I, uh, but that, of course, is the realm of the entrepreneur, right? Uh, new and novel things. Most startups don't succeed. 75% don't. Uh, but the ones that do are ultimately transformative. And if we're going to solve problems that have been with us for centuries and are still here for decades and are getting worse, uh, the problems we don't know about yet, we've got to move on from probability to possibility in more instances. And to some extent, um, that uh, that push, that move, that necessity has uh, really settled in my own mind over the course of the last eight years, investigating a question I've had, uh, which is, can we solve public problems anymore? Um, and arriving at the answer, which is yes, if possibility, yes, if we try these new novel things. But that question got put on my mind from my experience inside city government, uh, working for Mayor Menino and alongside so many great people um, uh, in the wake of the Boston Marathon bombing. And before that, as we tried to say, okay, in a fifth term of a, of a, of a mayorality, how do you move the city forward? The, Mayor Menino was constantly telling us the status quo is moving backwards. Okay, mm -hmm. well, if we want to move forwards, how do we do that? And in, and in our situation, the mayor's office of new urban mechanics was one way to do that, try to move uh, city government, actually pass the status quo, open it up to try new things, open it up to new ideas. And so this idea of possibility, I think, began to take shape. Uh, yes, in the mayor's office of newer mechanics. Yes, in the wake of some of the new ways we approach the uh, horrible tax in the marathon. And then, yes, as I as I took that, that question uh, actually around the world over the last eight years. So you mentioned the marathon bombing that happened while you were working in the Menino administration. Um, you know, people, uh, I don't think people realize that the creation of the one fund, which was the fundraising vehicle that, uh, that was created was a public sector idea. Um, you know, it recently succeeded in its mission. It just recently announced that it's closing. Um, but, but throughout your book, you talk about the experience of the marathon bombing as an, um, an opportunity, if you will, to, uh, to, to solve an urgent problem. There was no more urgent problem in the city of Boston th at that moment for sure. Um, but uh, talk about that, how the one fund got started and, and especially in the book where you talk about the power of minimally viable products in the public sector, um, because it, you bring the, the one fund and the marathon bombing throughout your book, you, it's, it's almost like a thread in, to illustrate in different ways, but, but in particular sort of the idea of experimentation of, of possibility of trying something that was new at the time and then a minimally viable product. Talk a little bit about the one fund from, yeah. you know, the, as, as you describe in your book. Sure. So the reason I spent some time on it in the book, and again, mostly I tried to look around the world and, and find other episodes of invention. But the reason I spent time on it was uh, here was a moment of crisis in the city. And we were, it turned out, inventive at that moment. And the hope, of course, is that, you know, you stay inventive afterwards. But if you're going to make that hope a reality, you need to understand how it was that you were inventive in that moment. And for me, that's so alive right in this very minute. We asked, oh, post-COVID, whenever that is, we're all going to be more inventive. Well, you know, I don't know. I mean, out of fear, anxiety, other things, I could see it's going back to the old way. It's important. It's essential that we understand how were we inventive in this crisis mm -hmm. so that we might carry it forward. It, so when I sort of reflected back on... Um, on our response to the, to the marathon attacks, there, there's some things that came to look clearer to me uh, than, of course, in that moment that, I, that, 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 that show the way, I think, about how we stay inventive post-crisis. Um, what happened was, obviously, that amazing Boston day was absolutely shattered when, when the two bombs went off, uh, when, when lives were lost at that finish line, when, when hundreds of lives were, were upended. Um, it was horrible, as you know, and, our, and, and your, your, your viewers, listeners know in this community. Um, but there was this outpouring of generosity from around the world. How can we help to where can we send money? The typical way in which cities collected and distributed those funds was that the long established institution in town did that. Um, this would be the foundation, the philanthropic community. Yeah. And, and you had Not seen it and yeah. you'd seen another example, Sandy Hook, you mentioned in the book and other places where that just took so long. Yeah, so Sandy Hook, um, you know, this horrible school shooting, it had been, uh, I think, 120 or more days since Sandy Hook when the bombings here happened. 
and not a penny had made it to the parents of those children who were killed or the, or, or the families of those teachers. And it was never going to bring those, li those lives back, but they were gifts from the world intended for those people. And they hadn't made it there yet. And so we, while we have amazing foundations in town um, and, and wonderful trusted leadership, we did feel like going that, that the way was going to be too slow, especially given that we had survivors who were going to be making decisions about limbs and homes and jobs. So we wanted to start our own, our own new fund. Uh, and, um, and so we did, uh, with, you mentioned it was publicly instigated. I mean, it was really a partnership between us and government and private sector partners. And, uh, it was up and running 24 hours, you know, after the, after the bonds and, um, but only with a, with a PayPal account, literally, if you go back and look at the website that was, was up and running that Tuesday night, mm -hmm. it's one sentence, the mayor and the governor put together this fund, you know, donate here, click here and link to a PayPal link. That's all it is. Um, and the reason, uh, why, uh, in part was just, well, we were under duress and speed and we just, you know, yeah. but the other thing is, and this is the important part, you mentioned minimally viable products. How do we begin to resolve uncertainty? Right. The big question in the air was, would anybody give to a new fund? Right. Would anybody give to a new fund? I mean, there's a reason long established, long trusted foundations step in because they're trusted. Would anybody give to a new thing? And to answer that particular question. All one needs, it turns out, is one sentence and a PayPal link. Eventually, we added the post office box. And eventually, eventually, of course, the website comes to have everything you would need. How do you apply? How will the monies be given out? Terms of use, privacy. How do you share that you've given? Eventually. Mm -hmm. But what I came to understand later as I began to understand more about hypothesis-driven entrepreneurship, lean startup, began to believe more and more in, in lean startup in public, that if your goal is to get started on something new, the first step is to begin to resolve your key uncertainties. And these, these minimally viable ways can be key for beginning to resolve those uncertainties. And I think the one fund has a really powerful lesson about, about that. Yeah. And you can take it one step further. You mentioned the, you know, the COVID pandemic, obviously the racial justice movement. Now you, you, having read the book, you finished it before the pandemic and before the racial justice movement sort of, um, sort of, you were able to sort of apply those two to uh, some of the principles. Well, I was, I was book, finishing right? it, but no, right. I, as you know, I went back and and and, re, and and added this 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 final chapter that dealt with a lot of that, and especially COVID. Exactly in Singapore, and and uh, which was fantastic. But but if you think about like for example in Boston, the racial justice movement, uh, you know, a, a a group of black executives um, created a fund for uh that they've now uh that they've been you know raising millions of dollars for racial justice to help small businesses and black owned and brown owned businesses in boston um in a similar way to to the way the one fund was you know it was, it was grassroots uh oriented and um and and we're we saw in in the COVID pandemic and the racial justice movement examples of what you call public entrepreneurship so i was wondering if you could you know talk a little bit more hear about how those two, you know, sort of world changing events, those phenomena have changed your perception now around public entrepreneurship and the possibility. Do people see you started out here by saying this? Do you see possibility government coming out of this? Or do you see us falling back into probability government in, in many cases? Well, on the, you know, on, on the on the on the racial justice side, I think watching all of this over the last, um, you know, obviously now, you know, couple of years, although of course it, it's been with us for our entire history. Um, I really see and have heard and listened to uh, people make a strong case, even though they don't use these words, for public entrepreneurship and possibility government in the context of uh, ending racial inequities. So um, in the modern era, uh, Melvin Carter, the mayor of St. Paul, um, Minnesota, who I, I find um, just very uh, brave and, and brilliant, uh, says, look, patience is for the privileged. Patience is for the privileged. And he has been urging his city to try new and novel approaches to dealing with racial inequity, to dealing with, uh, at the same time, uh, all the other um, challenges in his uh, city, you know, economic opportunity, uh, public safety. Uh, you know, he's the first black mayor of St. Paul. And he says, look, patience is for the privilege. I think we should, we should, um, listen to that. Mm -hmm. uh, I was reminded, uh, listening to Melvin of, uh, when Martin Luther King Jr. went to St. Paul, uh, Minnesota in his day and other cities 
and would remind people uh, of a story about people would tell him basically, oh, you should just wait, you should just wait, you know. Mm -hmm. And he would say, you know, time is neutral. And our job is to help time. And I really do deeply believe that public entrepreneurship and possibility government are a way to help time to move things forward faster than they're going. So, so I'm not pretending like this is the cure all to our, you know, systemic inequity. Mm -hmm. but I do think the techniques of possibility government can be brought to bear on uh, systemic uh, injustices um, and to try to change things where they haven't changed before. And on COVID, uh, COVID, um, look, I mean, there's this, there's this, uh, um, we saw a huge flood of innovation and entrepreneurship and trying new things by mayors, by governors, by other public leaders all around the world. Yep. And so many people just became instant entrepreneurs. And I do think that possibility government gives them a language, a framework to understand what they did during COVID so they can do it again on other topics. Yep. Um, and so I think that's a really powerful lesson from all this. You know, you were inventive then. How do you be inventive later? And then in addition, uh, I think it's important and the COVID has, I think, been a powerful learning base for this to discern between possibility and something much worse, more distracting, more uh, wasteful, uh, more dangerous. Mm -hmm. So we can also use the toolkit of possibility government. And I talk in the book about sorting out the difference between possibility and delusion mm -hmm. and make sure that when we're racing after new stuff, that we're, yes, moving past probability, but we're not uh, doing something, you know, more, more pernicious and, 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 or even just um, silly and distractive. And so COVID has been a, really an invitation to be more inventive, but an invitation to be inventive and not something else at the same time. And that brings me to uh, the, I, I just, I love the, the the lean startup models and some of the other entrepreneurship models that you apply to government and public, the public sector. Um, you know, early, early in the book, you talk about experimentation in the public sector. And, um, you know, you, you have a quote from former Massachusetts governor, Deval Patrick, who wrote that politics punishes failure, right? But Edison, you know, we know his famous quote of the light bulb, you know, I haven't failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work. I mean, you mentioned time, but elected officials only have two, four, six years. So well, they are there. You're time. elected the mayor of Boston. You might get 20. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But you still got to get elected. You got to get reelected once in a while. But, uh, but really the idea of a limiting factor of time, uh, a, a, a clear, uh, fascination and, and really just a uh, major fear of failure. Um, and yet experimentation that almost requires failure. If, if you're going to find success, how do you balance that? I'm, you know, what would you tell your readers? You, you say it in the book, but tell, tell the audience here how you balance what seems to be clearly at odds. Well, first of all, I think, um, uh, leaders, public leaders elected and appointed, um, have to be very clear with their elector, with their constituents, that you think this new thing is the risky choice, signs with their own workforce. You think the risk, the new thing is the risky choice. The status quo is the risky choice. When we have the, the challenge that we have doing nothing is actually a dangerous choice. So that's really step one. Um, you can fail, you can fail certainly through you know trying something and having not succeed. You can certainly fail through corruption and you can fail through uh, other ways. You can also fail by timidity and meekness. So I think that's that's really important. And by and and, and, and leaders have to communicate out to the public as well, because at the end of the day, we get the government we invent. We get the government we invent. And if we as the public don't provide some encouragement, some part, um, uh, you know, even co-participation in this, then our big problems are not going to get solved. So they have to explain why we need more tolerance for this. And the public has to grant more tolerance for this. I would say uh, that's number one. Number two, uh, we have to make sure if we're trying new things and we're failing, that we're doing that while spending a minimal amount of time and a minimum amount of money. I mean, our obligation, uh, if we're in the public sector and, and uh, have been entrusted with the public, uh, with public tax monies, uh, uh, is to is to try new things, but not do in ways that are wasteful, uh, harmful, dangerous. And so we have to get good at that. And so there's methods in the book about trying uh, in ways that don't waste uh, the public time and money. We have something, Doug, uh, in this country and around the world, I would say, which is a uh, hot, you know, hot stove government. And it's a riff on um, on James March, Dirk and Denrell, who were riffing in turn on Mark Twain, who tells the story of this cat who uh, jumps on a hot stove, gets burned, learns never to jump on it again, but also learns never to jump on a cold stove either. Mm -hmm. And it's a problem of overlearning from failure. And in, we have overlearned from past mistakes. 
uh, sure, sure, we're avoiding hot, you know, hot stoves. Uh, we have to uh, uh, learn how to get, you know, to, to try to find a way to some of those cooler stoves. And frankly, frankly, we got to find some way to turn down the stove. I mean, I, I do recognize that in the in the area uh, in the era of acrimony and polarization and partisanship and Twitter and everything else, it's very hard to be a public official these days and try anything new. And we got to find a way to, to make that more possible. We don't want to get rid of accountability. Again, for a corruption, lethargy, incompetence, we don't. We need accountability for that. But we've got to find a way to say, look, if you tried something new and you did it without wasting too much time, too much money, uh, we, you know, we value that. And we, we, we want you to go you know, do four or five other things modestly, find the one that works, and then solve the problems that face us. Right. And, in, and I, you also address the question when people suggest that public tax dollars shouldn't be spent on ventures with a high probability of failure. You have, you have an answer to that argument as well. I mean, the argument is wrong. Um, first of all, um, the government is more well positioned, especially our federal government, because of its scale and its taxing authority uh, than any other entity to absorb, spread, share risk. Colleagues of uh, mine, David Moss, uh, have shown that. Uh, go back to Ken Arrow, Nobel Prize winner has shown this. Um, the government is much better to, to absorb, spread risk than we as individuals. So the government not taking these things on doesn't eliminate the risk. It just leaves them people who can't, who are least positioned to, 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 to hold on to it. Um, in addition, the idea that government hasn't in the past or even in its present been sometimes at the avant-garde is also uh, wrong. Uh, Mariana Mazzucato and others have pointed out whether it's the iPhone or whether it's energy, the government has often paved the way with research and development dollars and, and, and other risk-taking endeavors. And we just forget, we somehow forget about those. So as we, you know, she points out, you know, as we, as we, rem you know, we recall Solyndra and how Solyndra didn't somehow turn out to be successful, we forget mm -hmm. that, that Tesla and you know, Elon Musk and other capacities, Solar City got plenty of government guarantees and backing. So we have a we have a idea in our head that government doesn't take risk or shouldn't take risk, and that's not historically accurate. I mean, this country was founded, right? George Washington calls this an experiment, finally staking the hands of the American people. Mm -hmm. People in Boston, uh, they were they were inventors, they were experimenters, they were tinkerers. They did not get it right. They did not get it right. There was you know there was so much that they got um, they that they got correct, and then there were there were there were grievous you know uh, horrible mistakes. And we try over time to erase those from um, or, or, or remedy those from our, his, from our history. Uh, our, we were born as tinkerers and we've somehow lost the ability to recognize that we need to fix what's broken. And, uh, and I, I just, we, we, have to, we have to say we must fix what's broken and we have to recognize the government uh, has to be part of that fixing. That's, that's great. Um, we're quickly running out of time. I, I, you have this one anecdote in the in the book about this uh, the Harvard Business School sign outside of your office and where the worn grass is, where people take their pictures, and what it taught you about human centered design thinking. Um, I don't even think we can get to that, it, but it's a great great part of the book. I have, I loved it. What I do want to make sure we get to though is the idea of extreme value ideas. So this is right along the theme that you're describing. So I want to keep on this for a second. Um, you know, I just love that Mayor Menino used to say that idea would die of loneliness in, in City Hall um, when the reality was that he really uh, wanted one or two extreme ideas. He didn't want a lot of ideas. He wanted one extreme idea rather than 100 mediocre ideas. Talk about uh, extreme value ideas in the public sector. It's a fascinating topic. Yeah. So I think what he, you know, he, when he said new ideas would die of loneliness, he did, Doug. He wanted one or two. Uh, he would have been happy with many, but one or two good new ideas to solve the problems that, that faced our community. And, um, and here's the fact, uh, we, when we go after more ideas, which we must, we must go after more ideas. When we do that, uh, one way of doing that is inviting in actually a much wider group of people to help us suggest ideas mm -hmm. and a much more diverse group of people to help us suggest ideas. And if we do that, we're going to get some tail end ideas. And yes, we're gonna get some ideas that maybe don't make sense or aren't appropriate. But the point of ex the scientists who study extreme, you know, value thinking say, out in that tail, um, there's also going to be one or two, uh, you know, ideas that is actually considerably better than the ideas that the internal experts have, right? I mean, on average, on average, the people who work in city government today mm -hmm. are going to have ideas of higher value. They know how things work, you know, but if you go out and if you invite a bigger group and you invite a more diverse group, you will on occasion and more than one occasion get a really powerful idea. And I think that's so important. We have to go invite those groups in, go invite that conversation in go uh, and, you know, give ourselves that tail because uh, we need, we need, we, if we just had 
uh, you know, one or two new big ideas on each one of the major problems that face us, we'd have a fighting chance of, of solving them. And I know some people will disagree. Oh my gosh, the last thing we need is more ideas. Yeah. But it turns out that um, we do, and we must. Well, it's, what's interesting is they're, you're, you're both right. They don't need more ideas. They just need that one or two, uh, you know, that one or two good ideas that only comes from more the, ideas. Yes. The, the more long tail ideas, which right. was, was fascinating. So, you know, you're, we could talk so much longer than this. I mean, you write about Airbnb in Amsterdam, you write about autonomous vehicles in Pittsburgh. Um, you know, uh, you talk about government as a platform, the idea of ways uh, and how ways is used to solve transportation problems. And uh, so there's some, this, the whole idea of, uh, you know, we hear software as a service, you know, platform, government as a platform. You, you talked about healthcare.gov. Um, you could have easily have been talking about the mass vaccination website that, you know, that rolled out in a utter failure, you know, in, in uh, April of 2020 when, um, and then a software coder, I don't know if you remember this, Olivia Adams, a software, co local software coder was on maternity leave. She, you know, she actually built her own website based off of the, the state's website that ended up working much better than the state's website. Um, so there's, there's lots of examples in the book, but what I want to end on is uh, to come back to the idea of uh, how you find extreme value ideas, how you find possibility and not probability. And for the uh, the folks in the audience who are, maybe they're a selectman or maybe they're on the school committee, maybe they're volunteering in their community. What are three action, or maybe they're mayors um, you know, in, uh, in, in, in the region, but what are three action items that a possibility leader can do right now? You gave so many examples, hackathons, all these others, but what are three that you would sort of leave with people that, show this sort of public entrepreneurship? So I'd say number one, go get, you know, we would talk about it in, in tech world or something, is go get close to your users. I mean, but Mayor Menino was a great example of this, right? Knew more than half, met more than half the people who lived in the city. If you want to begin the road towards possibility, go get with people in your community, see what problems they're facing and invite ideas from them. I'd say that's number one. Secondly, um, when you're, uh, team comes to you with an idea, ask them what has to be true for it to come to fruition, and then go tell them to find ways to test one or two of those uncertainties. Don't try to plan your way out of all these uncertainties and then get stuck not doing anything at all. Tell them to go test one or two of these uncertainties. And lastly, I'd say uh, when it comes to scaling these, uh, if you can, um, try to work eventually at population scale. These problems are so big, so much faces us, that you know, push yourself and your team to say, how do we fix this for, for everybody? Population scale. Well, Mitch, this is fantastic. I will uh, just say that when it comes to public sector, when it comes to government today, we, it's very easy to be negative. It's very easy to get downcast. But if you read this book, I would definitely tell people, I will tell people, pick up this book, We the Possibility, Harnessing Public Entrepreneurship to Solve Our Most Urgent Problems. Mitch Weiss, it was fantastic to spend a few minutes with you today. Just great to hear your insights, to learn from, from you in this book. And um, thanks so much for being here. Thanks, Doug. I, I really appreciate it. Hey guys, welcome to Authors and Innovators 2021. I'm Caitlin McCulley. I'm joined by Isaac Collins. He's a Kansas City-based entrepreneur and community leader. He's featured in the book, The New Builders, which really challenges the notions of who can be a successful entrepreneur in America. Isaac, it's great to talk with you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Yeah, so first of all, just tell me um, a little bit about your, your background, how you got started in entrepreneurship and and what the last year has been like for you i know it's been crazy for everybody yeah yeah so um man that's such a long story but <laughs> i'm isaac lee collins <laughs> i am um, an entrepreneur here in kansas city missouri i'm a local kansas city kid with wild dreams of always being an entrepreneur and uh you know like most people i didn't think it was going to happen until later in life, you know, until I was 40, 50, something like that, until I had a chance to build up some some money and uh, be able to invest in it after working in corporate for a couple of decades. Um, but I was really blessed that uh, through my college, they had this program that was actually helping graduating seniors and alumni to get into business. And uh, I decided to take that, that chance. And essentially, it was a semester long class. We wrote a business plan. We pitched it at the end. I won my year and then I was able to 
get into business. So I was thrusted into business at the age of 23 with no clue what I was doing. And I <laughs> learned on the job and made a lot of mistakes. And um, nine years later, uh, I've been blessed to own eight businesses and I'm married. We have a baby girl and my wife has her own business as well. So, so tell me about your business right now. Sure. So currently um, I own five businesses, four for profit and then one nonprofit. So my wife and I own three uh, yogurt teeny self-serve um, franchise lo locations here in Kansas City. So what that is, is it's self-serve frozen yogurt. We do it kind of in a different way. We're big time in um, investing into our community through fundraisers, donation events. Uh, we have parties every other week, being able to just get the community involved with what we're doing. We do a lot of give back efforts. So I guess I'm like a social entrepreneur, I guess you could say, in a way. Um, also, my wife and I and uh, two partners started this nonprofit called Superhero Yoga back in 2017, where we um, partner with local schools. And the whole mission is to serve trauma informed yoga to inner city kids during their school day at their school. And the whole goal of that is to um, allow them to learn ways to self regulate, to gain clarity and focus and to increase test scores, but also better their behavior and be able to lower their fight or flight response when it comes to that. So that's been cool. And my last one is um, I just started speaking and being a business coach. Since I have almost 10 years of experience, I just started wanting to give back to my community by um, helping entrepreneurs. So that's uh, me in a nutshell. That's awesome. So the book, The New Builder, <laughs> talk about having an idea, having a passion or a cause, and then setting out to create a business around that. For you, like, was there a, a continuous theme or, or, or passion that motivated you throughout these different businesses? Yeah. Uh, you know, for me, that is a very long story of just my life in general. Um, yeah. You know, my parents grew up in, I would say, unsavory circumstances, you know, surrounded by alcohol, drug addictions, gang violence, etc. And they had to flee that. They were doing it themselves when they got pregnant with me, decided to start over and change a new leaf. And, um, you know, the things that they struggle with as uh, teens and kind of growing older and whatnot, all the way to having me is the thing that they were seeking um, redemption in. And so some of the things they struggle with, substance abuse, mental health, etc., were the things that they actually went into as a career. And so for me, it wasn't really an option. Like I got raised by two people who are insanely invested in other people in um, living purpose, uh, not living a life of illegal activity and doing things the quote unquote wrong way, but living a life that's going to be a benefit to others. And so those are two humans I got raised by. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And so they taught me how to make money, but they also told me, taught me how to care about people and to give back. And so every business that I've done has some sort of give back effort and it kind of is a cool timing because that is where I feel our nation either is going or needs to go with making your profit, make your money, but also get back in the process. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I think the pandemic also has been a necessary pause for some people, some people a forced pause, other others by choice um, to kind of rethink your values, your goals, like wh what you want to do in this life and how you want to spend your time. Um, has this time been a time of reflection for you as well? Yeah. It, you know, I actually posted a couple pretty uh, um, vulnerable things on social media the last couple of days about that exactly. So for me, my world radically changed last year. Um, you know, it, professionally, it was actually really weirdly successful. So that's when we added our third Dogertini location. Uh, personally, like we bought a house, we had a baby girl, like we were getting a lot of things really figured out. We launched our, um, the coaching business. It was a success, I guess you could say. But, you know, with the pandemic happening and everything with the racial injustice, it was a hard time for me that brought up a lot of my trauma that I'd experienced in my life, but I'd never dealt with. And so for the first time, I had to start dealing with those things since we did have a lot of at home time with stay at home orders and uh, businesses being slower. So I got a chance to really dive deep into my mind, which has been very scary, um, but he very healing as well as I go through that. And I'm starting to just see things very differently and focus on living 
a life of passion and purpose and happiness more than just making money. Yeah, I hear that theme um, and a lot of people right now, especially. Um, how do you think that's going to look going forward? Like when we have people who maybe have been in traditional careers or or are, are exploring new creative options and trying to meld that with a business, what do you think our, our work life can look like or should look like? Sure. So for me, that's what my whole new business for my coaching is has been around because I think that this is something that is a really good step forward with how we do business. When I got into business, I hated the fact that it was so corporate. It was so cutthroat. You had to beat someone else. Someone had to lose. And I don't think a business needs to be like that. I think, um, you know, we can, we can all win. And I think that's the new way of business to have some sort of social um, mission behind it, or if nothing else, just being able to create a system and an environment where we're treating people better. It doesn't need to be a thing where it's top down. Like there, there's so many ways that, that people are being more innovative and creative and purposeful in how they're treating their employees, how involved their employees are, um, how they're trying to not necessarily overwork their people, but make sure life work life balance is, is something that's actually in the equation and that's being talked about. So I think that's creating healthier employees, healthier work atmospheres, productivity will go up because of it. And, you know, just being able to do good in the process, I think that's incredibly important and that's the direction we're going in. And is that something that you, like as a leader in your, in your businesses, try to, to get down to, to your coworkers and, and employees? Um, do you see younger people also starting to, to embrace these ideas maybe quicker than, than previous generations? A hundred percent. Yeah. So it's actually crazy. I feel like it's getting better in, in a way every, every generation. So a lot of the young entrepreneurs I work with now, this is what they're talking about. Like, how can we give back like Tom shoes? How can we do this? How can we do that? And I, I love that. I love that they want to give back. I love that, you know, they want to do good in this world and leave their mark and be remembered for something they did that was good. The only pushback that I have is sometimes people want to throw out the baby with the bathwater, meaning mm -hmm. they want to do so good that they kind of sometimes do it to a detriment of the profitability of their business to the right. point where they may not have a business for long. So uh, I, as a coach and someone who's been there and done that, made that mistake, it needs to be both where it's like you're focusing on the profitability and the success of the business while being able to give back and do good, whether that's a one for one program or just having the mission and purpose of your business to treat people well. Yeah. So we kind of touched on this. I mean, that's that's great advice. Is there anything else that you would share with people maybe new to entrepreneurship or considering it for the first time after this year that we've had? Yeah. So uh, <laughs> one of my favorite things to talk about in this world of entrepreneurship um, is being able to be competent in what you're getting into. So if you've heard any kind of business coach or motivational speaker talk, they talk about taking the jump, making the leap, getting into business, taking a chance, getting out of your comfort zone. And I think those things are wildly um, important. But what I think that we're doing, if we're not giving context and more there, is work telling people to make the jump out of the airplane that's 30,000 feet high without a parachute. Mm. If you don't know <laughs> the, the different facets of business that you need to run a successful, purposeful, healthy business, then you're not going to focus on those things. And those red flags and those things that you don't necessarily know will ultimately be the things that take you down. I see, I've seen it time and time again. And out of the businesses that I've run, the ones that have failed, have been because I wasn't competent in a certain area. So while I do think we need to take that jump because entrepreneurship is scary and you need to get out of your comfort zone to do it, you also need to be able to um, learn certain things about business in general, the pillars and the facets that are important. So when you do make that jump, you actually know the things um, that you need to know about your business to be successful. What has surprised you the most about entrepreneurship? I know that's a big question. As, wow, that's a really big question. Uh, I think that answer probably has changed a lot um, since I've been at it for almost 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think in the beginning, it was just the creativity and how you can... Well, I would say that's my answer now. In the beginning, it was how people can be the number one 
um, I would say exciting thing and thing that gives people purpose, like working with them and seeing them grow. But at the same time, they can also be the biggest headache, like mm-hmm. the biggest strength and the biggest weakness. Uh, you know, being 10 years into it now, I think the thing that's most exciting for me is seeing how much the business owner and the entrepreneur tries to bring to the world um, based off of who they are. And I love that. I think you do need a certain amount of separation between you and your business. But I also, ter- to a certain extent, don't know how that's possible because the businesses that I see have so much of that entrepreneur all over it. And I think that's a beautiful thing, especially in a world that tries to make you be cookie cutter, live the status quo, don't disrupt too much. Entrepreneurs all over the world are being unique, being creative, being innovative, and putting their hearts on the line to launch a business to add value and disrupt an industry to make the world better. And I think that's an amazing thing. What are you reading right now? Uh, I'm, I'm kind of different on that. Uh, that's changed as well. I actually don't read books anymore because I think they take too long. And I'm oh. very busy. So what don't, I do is... Don't tell anyone that. I know. I know. I, th- I That's one of those things you're not supposed to say. And I just... That's awesome. You know, I, I just do things very differently. And, you know, I have a, a four and a half month old now. And yeah. so I look at everything and I'm like, do I want to do this because it's going to take time away from my family? And if I say no, then I don't even think about doing it. So what I do is when someone references a book to me, I will go to YouTube and get the cliff notes in a review (laughs) video from a couple of people. And in that way, I think that I'm reading more books than I actually have the time to do. So controversial you're, there, but that's what I do. That's okay. You're, you're busy building and, uh, that's the, the new builders, the book that's, uh, that features you as well. Um, it, I, I appreciate your time, Isaac. Is there anything else that I didn't ask that you want to get across to people? Oh man, I think that's I'm it. sure there's a um, lot. I'm sure there's a lot. <laughs> yeah. I, I just, I, you know, this next wave we've, we've already talked about, but I think something that kind of couples it as a, um, as a, a sisterling is just the importance of mental health and emotional intelligence. You know, I'm I, as successful as I am. I'm going through a lot of mental health stuff right now that I'm just starting to be more vocal about. And I think it's freeing for myself, but it also frees other people to be able to share how they're feeling. I think that's very important. So, um, you know, if you are an entrepreneur out there, whether new aspiring or you're seasoned, you have to bring the emotional intelligence into it because people are not robots. They have feelings, they have emotions, they have families, they have thoughts, they have opinions, and all those things matter inside of it to make them feel like they belong and that they want to belong uh, with your company. And if you stifle that, then someone else will will listen to them and, and hear them out to make a better work environment. So, All right, Isaac Collins, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Yeah. And for those of you watching, we'll have more interviews with authors and innovators throughout the week. If you want to check out any of the books that we mentioned, uh, you can click the link. There's a link to the independent bookseller on your screen as well. See you soon. I'm delighted that you're here to continue our conversation about the role of the entrepreneur uh, post-pandemic. Today, we're talking about reclaiming values and rebuilding community uh, and what entrepreneurs can think about it. And I can't think of a greater value uh, that we should be considering these days than trust. And for that reason, I'm really, really pleased that we have with us uh, Professor Sandra Sutcher, co-author with Shailene Gupta uh, of Trust, How Companies Build It, lose it and regain it. Uh, For those of you who don't uh, follow uh, Sandra's work, please do. Uh, She is a trust researcher and a longtime and beloved professor at Harvard Business School, where she's best known for her work in a couple of classes, The Moral Leader and Leadership and Corporate Accountability. She's the author of countless cases, articles, um, and three books. And prior to joining HBS, she had a long career in retail. Uh, as well as um, uh, a bit of work in financial services at Fidelity. She's also the past chair of the Better Business Bureau. Sandra, welcome. I'm so pleased you're here. Uh, And I'm glad that we get to talk about this book. I like to start these off with giving 
our viewers who are students and CEOs and entrepreneurs and investors a sense of who they're talking to. Tell us about you. Where did you grow up? How did you get interested in this? And how did you go from retail and fidelity to the calling of being in front of students every morning? Uh, so I'm glad you start with easy questions, Larry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, so let's think. I grew up in Detroit. Uh, I had a somewhat unusual background. Uh, the, I went to public schools. My schools were half black and half Jewish. So we had four natural blondes in a graduating class of 717. <laughs> wow. Uh, and wow. I was not prepared for the world I entered at the University of Michigan, uh, where I did my undergraduate work. Uh, so I, I landed in Cambridge because my dad insisted that I get a teaching degree, uh, which was one of the few ways that he could guarantee that I could support myself financially. Wow. Uh, so I said, if I get into Harvard Graduate School of Education, will you foot the bill? He said, if you get into Harvard, I'm paying. Uh, so, so he did, like the I did. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and so I, you know, I haven't looked back. I'm still here and, and love it here. Uh, so uh, I, I think that uh, the way to, the way I think about my career is that uh, it's heavily um, uh, invested in the stuff that's always mattered to me. So for my background, I've always thought about differences and how it is that people relate to each other uh, in ways that are productive. Uh, I've always thought about fairness uh, and how it is that people can be fair to each other and what that looks like. Uh, and because of my work in industry, uh, I've always then thought about how can you build organizations that are capable of kind of living up to their best view of themselves. So if on a good day, you could be the organization uh, that you want to be, what would that day look like and what would you be doing? Uh, so that's shaped the work that I've done. Uh, and uh, I actually started in the MBA doctoral program uh, at HBS. Uh, and I left after getting my MBA because I'd only done nonprofit work. And I thought, how could I teach about business if I hadn't been in business? Wow. Uh, so I thought that would just be a couple of years. It turned out to be more than 20 uh, because I really liked business. Uh, and I'd still, I'm an equal opportunity business lover. There's almost no business I'm not interested <laughs> in on some dimension. Oh, I'm, well, I'm so pleased. And trust is a special area. It's a special word. As a corporate lawyer, I can tell folks you can't even use the word trust in your corporate name unless you have special permission, uh, depending on where you are. Hmm. And I know that from your work at the Edelman Trust, um, trust is um, in every sector has declined uh, over the last few years. And um, it's, not, <laughs> uh, it's not a simple thing to define, but yet in trust, um, you do in this terrific readable book with great examples. Tell our viewers who are trying to get a sense of this, trust has a few components uh, in your framing. Right. So tell yeah. us about that. Yeah, so, uh, so let me just start, uh, Larry, with a point you just made, which is how on earth do you define trust? Uh, so one of the pieces of this project was to say, uh, and the project really is about how to operationalize trust. We know this is a good thing. Uh, we know it helps build relationships. I'll share data if you're interested into how that works from a financial standpoint in businesses. Uh, and what I got interested in was what's the definition of trust and how can we understand what a business can actually do about it? So it's not just like the glue that holds us all together. Uh, so the definition of trust, which surprised me, I don't know if it will surprise those of you who are on the call, uh, is that trust is a willingness to be vulnerable uh, to other people's actions and intentions. Ah, wonderful definition. Uh, and not something so, you think about in business. Exactly. And so, so what you do when you think about yourself as sort of building trusting relationships is it it causes you to really sort of picture your organization from the viewpoint who are, I can think about this like as people outside a window looking into your business. And so when you work on trust, you're always trying to take the perspective of those people who are willing to make themselves vulnerable and try to figure out on what basis are they doing that? Why are they willing to trust you? And what can you do to have that go better? Uh, and if they trusted you and things have gone south, what can you do to recover that? Uh, but to trust, to study trust in an organization means you, by definition, look at your business from the standpoint of its stakeholders in and not from the business out. I love it. Uh, and, yeah. I so, love it. So Internal and sort of external. 
and your framing of it, you say it has four components. I, wanna, I want right. people to read all the examples, but I think it's helpful for them to understand how you're framing this, because I think it's really, um, uh, it, it's really a unique and innovative way to think about trust, particularly when you fold in the different examples. Yeah, great. So, um, uh, so I'll, I'll use Uber uh, just so that I'm not like an academic spouting, a, you know, kind of a framework <laughs> at you. Thank you. <laughs> right. And I will populate it with like with content uh, and an example we know. So, uh, so the foundation of trust, the first element is competence. Now, that's not surprising. You know, you wouldn't be in business. Uh, but if you think about it from this willingness to be vulnerable, no one's going to trust you if you're not good at delivering the thing you're supposed to do, right? So that is without question the foundation of trust. And Uber did that phenomenally well. They created ride hailing as we now know it. You know, we call a car, we know when they're coming, we get in, we get to the place we want to go, no money changes hands. Uh, and, uh, and at the end, you know, we get to rate each other. And none of that existed before Uber. Right. So from a competence standpoint, it's like, oh, my gosh, you know, it doesn't get better. Uh, but that doesn't explain why in 2018, 200,000 people deleted Uber uh, from their phones. Right. Uh, and they said, I'm simply not going to use this ride hailing service. Uh, and so they did that because competence is not enough to build trust. So the other, there are three other dimensions, and they're largely in what you can think of as kind of the moral domain, because trust is a moral mm -hmm. and ethical concept. Uh, and the first of those is, is your motives. So people actually care about why you do what you do, and what they mean by that is whose interests do you serve in addition to your own? So here's an example, a terrible example. In 2013, an Uber driver struck a family of four in San Francisco, uh, killed the six-year-old daughter, injured the mother and brother. Uber was taken to court by the family. Oh, I remember this uh, case. Yeah. Yeah. In, in court, Uber claimed that the driver wasn't an Uber employee because at the time he didn't have a passenger in his car and he had not yet accepted his next ride. Wow. So not our problem. Not our problem. It, Right. So you say, whose interest does Uber support? Certainly not the family who right. the company had injured. And they even threw their own driver, as it were, under the bus uh, and saying that you are kind of on your own in this regard. So, so most people say, OK, I get it. Uber, it, their priorities in terms of whose interest they serve, it's all about Uber. So that, you know, that's the, the motives question. Uh, then you sort of look at, the, at what we call fair means. It's the next dimension is how you go about doing what you do. Uh, and so in the case of Uber, uh, between 2013 and 2015, this is a true story, uh, Uber directed its drivers to book and then cancel 5,000 rides on Lyft. Now, oh, they wow. did that to put a dagger in the heart of their prime competitor. Uh, anybody who knows anything about the world, much less business, would say that's unfair competition. Uh, and it's this notion of sort of fairness. And it's like, well, grow your business. That's fine. Just don't grow it that way. Uh, and so you say, OK, so Uber motives kind of shaky, means not so great. Uh, and then the last dimension, this is uh, if we have a contribution to the world of trust, it's here. Uh, it's to sort of identify the fact that impact matters. Company actions have results. Uh, and when we decide whether or not to trust a company, we're sort of not in the land of what you tell me to trust you for. I'm in the land of what can I see with my own eyes about the impact of your actions on my life and the life of other people. Uh, so in Uber's case, in 2017, uh, there was a re reliability engineer. Her name was Susan Fowler. She wrote a blog post about, uh, after she left, about how lousy it was to be a woman at Uber. Right. And she detailed many awful things about what it was like. <clears throat> uh, and here's, here's the impact issue. So uh, when she left in 2017, she started and women were 25% of the engineers in her division. And when she left, they were 6%. Wow. <laughs> so Uber didn't set out uh, to kind of create a hostile environment for women, but they did. And when you judge them, you judge them on the basis of the impact that they have and not just their intentionality. So those are the four dimensions, competence, motives, means, and impact. Uh, and, you know, they also have, you know, real results. Uh, so Uber started with roughly 90% of the share of the ride-hailing market in the U.S. Uh, they now have about two-thirds. 
and who owns the rest? It's Lyft. Right. Uh, right. And so, and so, when you're not trusted, you open a window for your competitors to walk into, and pretty much all Lyft had to do was not be Uber, to have people <laughs> decide I'm going to go and yeah. do business with those guys, right? Yeah. So, so that's how tr trust works. It's multi-dimensional. Uh, that's sort of good bad news on the one hand. You're managing many things, and it's good news because you can go after each one of these. Uh, as a sincere effort on your organization's part, are we competent? What do people, whose interests do people see us serving? And what conclusions did they draw from that? Are we fair? Uh, and what impact are we actually having? That's, a, that's a, you know, the kind of strategic planning exercise that I used to lead at Fidelity and at Filene's. Uh, it's a natural way for a group of business people to sit around and try to figure out how can we see our world the way that other people see us? Because uh, those are the people that need to trust us. And the way you're framing that, that's why I love the book. It's so topical. You're really saying, look, in post-pandemic, especially, um, economic logic alone doesn't yield an answer on this. You can look at all kinds of strategy books, but it really, the foundational piece of this is trust. So I want to talk a little bit about, I want to have you give some of our folks some advice. So we'll have companies at different stages, Sandra. Some, some are early, some are have been doing this a while, maybe have a round of funding and thinking about acquisitions, and then more established companies. And then I'm going to get to apologies for, for messing up trust. But I want you to think about, and when you think about companies at those three different sort of stages, um, let's take them one by one, uh, Sandra. What advice would you say to someone who's saying, look, um, uh, Post-pandemic, I have l listened to my life, and it does not include that job I was just doing. <laughs> I want to do something new, different, fun, that has a sustainable competitive advantage. Maybe I should be a B Corp. How should that group, that person, those founders, that group, think about trust at the earliest stages? So this is a great opportunity to build this into your company from the beginning. Right. Uh, so, you know, most companies are in the business of, I wonder where we are and what do we need to do to fix the problems that we may have? <laughs> you, you know, if I'm starting out, it's like, OK, how can I start my business with a window that provides me insight into how my customers see me, how my investors see me, how my employees see me uh, and really taking that other person's perspective uh, in deciding that you're going to operate in a way that tries to build trust with each one of them. So the thing about trust is it's, it's actually in a funny way quite limited, uh, meaning that it's built interaction by interaction. And that can be whether I'm looking at your website uh, or ah. interacting with a human being. Uh, and so, you know, that's a, that's a good thing if you're a business person. Because uh, it means that each time you're interacting, someone's interacting with you, that's an opportunity where trust can be got gained or trust can be lost. And so if I were a new management team, honestly, I just focus on that question. Wow. You know, is the decision we're about to make going to build us trust and with whom? Uh, or is it going to lose us trust? And how do we navigate sort of making a good decision, uh, knowing that we think that that's going to be the outcome? I'd also open up some window of insight that allows you to talk to the people whose trust you want. Uh, and one of the things I found in working with uh, young entrepreneurs uh, at HBS uh, is that the stage of actually going out and talking to your customers. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, it's the most fun, kind of, right? It's the most yeah, fun. Well, it's fun, but it's also scary. Much easier right. to think about what's the app I'm going to build, you know, what's sure. the market that I'm going into. Uh, and so I think the sooner that you get into the world of talking with your customers and really starting to understand what they're looking for, for sure you're going to talk to your investors. That's without question. Uh, and so, but it's really the customer orientation and and then trying to figure out sort of how you want to build an organization that itself builds trust from the inside out. Uh, great advice. So start with start with the customer. How about that established company, Sandra? And so use the, the example of, say, Patagonia, right? So yeah. they're building, they, they have a great business, and then they decide, I think we're just going to use organic cotton. And I don't care. We're just, uh, our supply chain decisions, everything's just going to change. And I'm sure folks around that table took a deep breath and said, 
okay, maybe this is about trust, but what if it doesn't work? What do you say to that company um, in addition to doing an offsite and reading The Power of Trust? <laughs> what, what are the kind of things that they ought to be thinking about? We've already got customers. We already have a recognized name. What are the kind of things that we should do to maintain trust? So, you know, from from the standpoint of an ongoing business, I think that one of the real issues is how do you figure out whether or not you're trusted now? Ah, okay. Right. So there's like a, this measurement question. Uh, and so we're, I've been doing research. I'm writing a case about a company, in, uh, uh, a fintech company in Kazakhstan. Okay. Uh, okay. And, and they have one they created in 2012, like one of the first super apps where you could do everything on your phone that used to require going in and out of many different applications to perform. You can you know, trade, you can, do, uh, you can make purchases, you can pay your bills. Uh, and so they now half the population of Kazakhstan, the adult population, uses this super app. Uh, and this organization early on decided to focus on the net promoter score, but they do it in a very particular way. Uh, they ask one question only, uh, which is, would you recommend us to, uh, after someone's had an interaction with the company? Uh, and they then listen to the phone calls of the people who explain why. <laughs> All right. Wow. Uh, Revealing, and, right? It's, they make 40,000 outbound calls a month because oh they goodness. have literally millions of transactions. Uh, and then they use the data from these both to look at the product level and to sort of say, what things do we need to fix? They use it to manage, to help manage their three releases that they do in their technology a year uh, and to help them think about where some new opportunities are. So that's like a very common tool uh, that almost all businesses use in some fa fashion. Uh, and it's a, But it's a very sophisticated way to think about how can I use that tool to get close to understanding how my customers experience me. And so what the CEO told me uh, when we were doing the interviews with him was that he knew he couldn't introduce a new product on the platform if people didn't like the current one. Ah, yeah. And so he said that, you know, for us, you know, customer love being trusted really became our window into how it is that we built our business because we knew that if people aren't using our first app, first, you know, functionality on that, they're certainly not going to use the second. Uh, and so that logic of understanding that you're building your business uh, through positive customer trust and engagement, you know, they, that has changed their business. Uh, and they, they've grown tremendously. They IPO'd uh, in Europe, and they've done really, really well because wow. they're a very button-down wow. kind of organization. Wow. So real-time engagement to uh, assess trust. Uh, let's talk about those companies that blew it in some way. And you've got a terrific chapter in here, The Art of Constructing, uh, constructing Apologies. And I know from uh, your past writings and listening to you, um, I think things like, well, mistakes were made, drive you bananas. So um, let's talk about a company that, um, a couple of situations uh, where, hey, there's been, yeah, we're sort of using your data in a way we didn't tell you, but we're going to create new products and that's what we do to sort of, um, oh, did we say we'd have that product update next week? We meant uh, six months from now. So talk about those, Sandra, and, and those situations uh, where one, you just blew it. We trusted you with data. Talk about um, exposing vulnerability and other situations that are a bit more pedestrian, which is Boy, I know we keep pushing um, the product upgrade out and we keep missing that deadline. Sorry. How do, the, how do companies deal with trust in those situations? Yeah, so, uh, so one of the surprises in the research is that uh, recovering trust is a process unto itself. Right. Right, so there's a process to build trust, and then there's things go bump in the night, now what do I do? Uh, and so I'll, I'll use the apology framework to explain what you're doing when you're recovering lost trust. Uh, so that this is, you know, for those of you listening, this is easy. Follow these three steps and you will have a good apology. <laughs> so, uh, and I'll tell you a story about a company that's in that sort of middle ground of the world didn't come to an end, people, you know, planes didn't fall out of the sky, uh, but it still was something that was pretty damaging. So, so step one is that you have to acknowledge uh, responsibility and say you're sorry. Now, it turns out this matters a lot to people. Yeah. Like if you've created harm, 
Uh, you have to be the one who's willing to say, we know we did this and we're sorry for the effect that this had on your life. Uh, and the reason why that matters is this notion of trust is a, is a moral concept. Uh, and so this is how you're recovering trust because you once again are becoming someone who takes my interest into account because you care that you've created harm for me. So that's the first step. Uh, the second step is you then owe people a kind of an explanation of what went wrong. You know, so if you're six months late, you know, here's what we thought, here's what we did, and here's why we're late. Uh, and that helps people because they go, okay, they not only get it, they had a reason for why it is that this mistake happened. Uh, and the last part that's really important is an offer of repair. This is like, okay, ah, okay. and now that we've done this, now what are we going to do about it going forward? So so a, a great example of this is uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers in the Oscars. Uh, and uh, they mistakenly yes, identified <laughs> yeah, one year, you know, one best winning picture for another. Uh, and by the next morning, uh, they had an announcement up on their website and in other places. And the announcement is started by acknowledging the fact that this had gone wrong, apologizing to the people who were mistakenly confused in terms of who won and who didn't, uh, complimenting the host for how well he handled it. Uh, they then went on to say, here's how it happened. You know, someone uh, on our team was on their way, uh, on their phone, uh, and they actually just the envelopes got mixed up. And the offer of repair is we're going to create a process where this can never happen again. And what they ended up doing was the obvious step of saying no one gets to take their phones on stage. Uh, the less obvious step uh, was that everyone has to memorize the winners so that you know if there's been a card that is mistaked. And so, so what happened was that, you know, by the way, there was a hashtag at the time that said something the equivalent of PWC uh, stands for probably wrong card. Uh, so, <laughs> so, you know, so, you know, so this is yeah. not like the end of the world, uh, but it's pretty visible. Uh, and, and Tim Ryan, who, uh, who's the CEO uh, of the U.S. firm who I know and was in charge at that time, it, you know, that was really quick and good thinking on their part, right? And so they showed, you know, so this is, I wasn't even thinking, you know, writing the book at the time. Uh, so that shows that these three steps of acknowledging responsibility, explaining what happened, offer repair, they're pretty intuitive, Right. So we've been able to codify them with some right. stories in the book that help right. you understand it. it it's, but... a ter it's a terrific chapter. Uh, I love that. Yeah. Acknowledge, explain, offer to repair. In, in the minute or so that we have left, Sandra, um, in addition to uh, reading Trust, which I'm recommending to folks, because this is about books and great books, what are the other things that you're recommending um, to, the, to this group of folks, this group of leaders who want to learn more about trust um, things that you've written, things that you look at, websites, anything like that, where can they learn more about mm. trust, whether that's a book recommendation or they should simply stay tuned for more about uh, the power of trust? I, so um, so I, I, I'd, I'd recommend two things. Uh, one may be obvious, but maybe not. Uh, one is, you know, the Wall Street Journal and the Times uh, do a great job of tracking scandals. Right. So, so there is a scandal brewing right now uh, in the world of autonomous driving. Right. Uh, you know, and companies that are in that business are starting to be scrutinized for how safe their technology is. So the first piece of advice I'd give uh, is, is start reading the newspapers that you read with an eye to trust. And because then you'll get a flavor for how these things unfold, what it looks like. Yeah, because they never happen yeah. like all at once. Uh, they build over time, and and so so that'll kind of help inform your your vision. Uh, the second piece of advice is a little unusual, uh, which is to get to know another culture. So I've recently become a fan of what's called K drama. Uh, this is <laughs> Korean uh, TV serials, uh, and I've watched probably thirty of them since lockdown. Uh, and, uh, and what I have found was not only are they marvelous, and if you go onto my author website, you'll see a special section devoted to oh, my favorite fun. That's great. Korean <laughs> dramas, uh, but I have immersed myself in learning about a culture that thinks differently from mine. So it's like, you know, how does right versus wrong show up? 
which it does in almost all of these. Yeah, how do family relations unfold? Uh, what kind of obligations do people have to each other? How do they express remorse? Uh, you know, what religious issues uh, are prominent in their culture? Uh, and I have found that actually that immersion in other cultures to be really helpful, again, to take this stakeholder view, uh, because that's taking the view of someone who's different from you. And so you need some kind of an on-ramp for yeah. how you build your sensibility to do that. So that's my current advice, more because it's fun. Uh, and if you want one to start with, start with Vincenzo, which is on Netflix. <laughs> uh, and it's right. about a, a Korean guy who becomes a conciliary to the mafia. I will not explain why. Uh, and he returns to Korea to repatriate some gold. Uh, and it's all about the, the moral code of the mafia and the kind of things that they will and won't do and how different it was from the gangsters that he's fighting against in Korea. So, so yeah. Wow, so be entertained and get a new perspective. Well, exactly. I just love it. Um, uh, uh, Sandra Sutcher, this has been such fun. The book is The Power of Trust. Please take a look at this book. Please dive in. It's uh, The stories are terrific. I read it in one sitting. You will too, I think. <laughs> and uh, stay tuned for more. Sandra, thank you again. Thank you, Larry. Thanks so much.